Judge Mwepe was born in Limpopo. Right? Limpopo is producing. Yeah? where he attended school until a secondary level, after which he moved to Pretoria for his matric, and he later read for his B.U.R.I.S. degree at my alma mater university. That's where I graduated, Teflop, intimately known like that, but it's University of Lipopo now. Uh, at those days uh, when we were there, uh, I was there in the 80s, and when I asked him when, when he was there, he said he was there in 60. 1968-69, so you can see. While we were in the same university, it was two generations. Uh, uh, it was, um, but that university has produced amazing leaders uh, that have uh, made a contribution in this nation. And he obtained his postgraduate degree, LLB, at the University of South Africa, and he practiced for many years, first as an attorney and later as an advocate, acquiring a status of senior counsel before he was appointed a judge where he served before taking optional retirement. Listen to me, I always say, run your race, in your lane, at your own pace to reach your own destination. This is the man who's run his race in the legal field at his own pace and he Look, let, let me read what he's doing now. Poor currently, he's at our South Africa's tax ombud. Uh, so just make sure you sort out your tax. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. It's tax season now. <laughs> the, earlier on this, 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 this evening, uh, I was part of the session that was actually interviewing the commissioner of SARS, uh, Commissioner Edward Kisweda. It was just amazing, the work that he's doing there. He's also chairperson of the Appeals Board of the Council for Medical Schemes, chairperson of the Appeals Panel of the South African Press Council, chairperson, you, have, you see how many chairpersons? <laughs> chairperson of the Final Appeals Committee of the Advertising Regulatory Board, and finally independent head investigating unit, Cricket South Africa. Some of the positions previously held, Chancellor. Uh, of the University of South Africa, judge and judge president of the North uh, uh, and South Houghton High Courts, judge and vice president of Africa's Union, African Court of Human Rights and People's Rights in Tanzania. I told you that we are impacting, impacting the continent, uh, very important. Chairperson of the Court of Military Appeals, chairperson of the Magistrates Commission, which appoints magistrates in, in the country member of the Judicial Service Commission, which interviews and recommends and for appointment all the judges in our country, member of the Amnesty Committee of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Some of you are young, but there was Truth and Reconciliation Committee here. What I really like is that, you know, he's one of those who gave birth to this democracy. Uh, Judge Mnep was a member of the eight-person technical team which helped draft the country's interim constitution in 1993 for the negotiating parties under which the country's first democratic elections were held and the role later resulted in him taking part in a workshop for a new constitution for the Rwanda in Kigali. You, you see the impact you have when you really stay on your lane. Judge Mwepe regularly participated on national radio, television stations, and print media on a number of issues of national importance. Uh, he has expressed himself on many issues. Look at the doctoral, honorary doctorate that he's got. Honorary doctorate by University of Limpopo, uh, doctorate of laws by University of South Africa, a doctor of law by the University of Venda for Science and Technology, and a doctor in education by National University of Columbia, Bogota, Columbia. Appointment as honorary professor of law in, in Teflop, uh, and a number of awards that is won. Why don't we give a round of applause? <laughs> He's an inspiration to you when you still have another 40, 50 years to live. You need to, he's living in your dreams already. Over to you, Daddy. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, I always say that 
We've been taught that where there is no vision, the people perish. But it's also true that where there is no visionary, there is no vision. So can we please honor the visionary of the house, Ntate, Prof. Kade. <laughs> Judge uh, Ngoepe, you've been welcomed by the prof, but please allow me to also extend a warm welcome uh, to your P. Welcome to your P. Ntate. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, every great endeavor is driven by purpose. This is a great endeavor. What was the purpose behind it? What, what, what drove you to write this book? Um, before I get there, let me thank prof for this wonderful invitation and <clears throat> no doubt an engagement that I'm looking forward to. It's not the first group of young people that I'm addressing. I think about a month or so ago, I addressed about 30-something or 40-something young professionals. By young professionals, I mean people in their 30s and the like belonging to different professions. It was at their request and in connection with this book. And there were, it was a mixture of lawyers, and doctors, and engineers and the like. They just wanted to engage me about this book. I love that engagement. And just as I'm, I'm going to love this engagement, I have that no. feeling. <laughs> thank you very much for this invite. And thank you all for, in, for coming here. Mm. Earlier on, Prof said to me, don't be disappointed if the house is not full because there are participants outside, virtual participants. But the house is full. I'm very happy. <laughs> And let me tell you, my after, my, immediately after my appointment as the Chancellor of UNISA many, many years ago, I served there for 16 years, four terms as the Chancellor. After my appoint, appointment, um, I don't know, some people panicked. And they, they wanted me to come and address the university community. And somebody said to me, <coughs> excuse me, I think we should invite a person like Bishop Tutu also to come so that we could have a house full. And I said to him, I don't want a rented crowd. <laughs> <laughs> if there turned out to be 20, only 20 people in the hall, but came strictly on the basis of coming to listen to me, I'll be a lot happier than if the hall is full of rented crowd. So this is not a rented crowd. And I'm happy with this crowd. And guess what? It's a full house. And thank you all who are listening to me virtually. Um, to go back to, to, to your, your question, it's what we, I can say is a very pregnant question. I can answer it from many, from many perspectives. But let me start with the simplest thing. And I'm aware I'm talking to young people. Like Prof tells you, you must write. You know why you must write? Because, as they say, the faintest ink is stronger than the strongest memory. Mm. Do you get that? Mm. Yeah. The faintest ink is stronger than the strongest memory. Don't say things will be remembered. Therefore, we don't have to write. You must write. You write and write and write. Mm. And I've written and written so that as Charles Dickens said, when my bones and sorrows are dust, you'll be able to read what I've written. Yeah. So that is the importance of writing. Now, in particular about writing this book, we, we are living in a country which, in my judgment, has lost the plot somewhere along the way, we have. And in this book, ladies and gentlemen, if you read this book, I don't, you won't find me mentioning the ANC, the EFF, the DA and the like, because 
I, didn't, I wrote this book because I didn't want to speak to the ANC. I have no business to talk to the ANC. I don't, I don't, I don't owe any duty to speak to the ANC or the EFF to, to the DA or whatever. I have a responsibility to speak to my people. And by my people, I mean South Africans. Because we are all first South Africans. Maybe I'm starting it in the middle. I should say we are all humans. And then South Africans. Before you are ANC, EFF, DA. First and foremost, you are a South African. You owe your duty, first and foremost, not to your political party, but to the country, to the people of this country. Be a South African first before you can become anything else. Can you see I'm shaking my head? You know why? I'm just thinking of a politician who once said, I won't go and attend a government function because I, I had to go and attend a, an ANC function first. ANC comes first. Is that true? Does any political party come first in this country? No, ladies and gentlemen. What comes first in this country is the interests of this country. Patriotism trumps everything else. You see, if you are going to put the interests of your political party above the interests of the country, you know what you are going to do. You are going to steal the state money and channel it to your political party. You are going to do all sorts of things. Now, every nation that is worth its salt must from time to time sit back and reflect and look back and say, are you on the right track? And this book, I wrote it because I wanted to invite you as South Africans to sit back and reflect and say, are we on the right track? Are we doing the right thing? And if we don't, we must rectify the situation. What do you do when you suddenly realize you are driving a car is going the wrong direction? Don't you try to steer it back to the right direction? You try to do that. This is an attempt. This book is an attempt to, 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 to say to all of us, we seem to be going the wrong direction. Let us reflect and see whether we cannot go back and remedy the situation and take the right direction. In the book, I say, A history, or rather I say, I regard the past as the greatest teacher. You know why the past is the greatest teacher? Because the past is history. And you know why history is the greatest teacher? Because history does not change. History does not change. If somebody comes to tell you, if a book comes up and it presents you a, a history that is not true. It is not the history that is true. It is the book that is untrue. It's the distortion of history that is untrue. The one thing about history which I like is that, as I've said to you, it does, it does not change and nobody can change it. Precisely because history, I have so much respect for history precisely because it does not change and no man can change it. Because of that, it's a very important point of reference. The most important point of reference is something which doesn't change like the Cape Town weather. Tomorrow is raining, tomorrow <laughs> it's not like, no. It is an important point of reference. You can look back and say, am I on the right track with reference to history? And history will, say, tell, will tell you that you are on the wrong track. 
as I was talking to all those young people, and some of them kept asking questions, I would answer them, but then say, no, I'm stopping. I'm not giving you the full answer. They said, why? I said, go and read the book. <laughs> and somewhere along the way, someone will answer the question. It became a mantra in that, in that, in that room. And then somebody will ask me the question, a question. Someone will stand up and say, go and read the book. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Job. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the value of history. In the, and that is why I wrote the book. Thank you. <laughs> one of the, the gems uh, that I, I discovered, one of the rich pickings that I discovered in the book uh, is, is in the form of a phrase. And you said, logged in every experience, happy or sad, is a lesson that can be learned. Judge, please take us to Limpopo. Uh, Prof mentioned that that is uh, where your beginnings were. Can you take us to the village that raised you and the rich pickings that you got from there, particularly the family environment, which you speak quite about in the book, and in particular as well to your grandmother, whom you helped who was visually impaired? Uh, you know, uh, yes, maybe I should start with the, the grandmother after whom I was named. Yeah, Machal. Yes. And um, in, in the book, I extol the virtues of naming after. You know, you young people these days, you just, you have a child, you pick up the, na the name from the air, grab the name from the air. What is your, your child's name? You, you say, you, you like somebody who played a piano and you, you name <laughs> after. <laughs> <laughs> you name him after that person. Uh, we, we in African culture, we don't do that. If you read the book, it will tell you the pattern of naming after. I was named after my, my grandmother, who was visually impaired. I say in the book that she brought up my mother and her sibling, siblings in darkness. But it was easy during that time because the community would always support everybody and each other. And from that situation, my, 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 myself and my siblings, we, we took turns in leading our grandmother. Because our grandmother, this was my maternal grandmother, she lived with my mother. You know, girls, can look after their parents better than boys. <laughs> it's an objection. <laughs> objection dismissed. <laughs> the judge has spoken. <laughs> so she she lived with my mother and my mother looked after her. So we, we used to, we took turns by leading my grandmother, my eldest brother's turn came, my other sister, and then my turn came. And I held that privilege of leading my grandmother the longest period because as a result of a combination of some, some factors, uh, I describe them as conspiracy, as a result of the conspiracy of some factors, one of which was that my younger sister, for reasons only got new, uh, came only after six, seven years after me, and there was nobody in between. And, and no miscarriage, nothing, but just got planned that way. And because of that, I had the longest period, the privilege of leading my grandmother, after whom I was, I was named. And I learned, a lot, I learned a lot of things from somebody with disabilities. And I say in the book, my grandmother courageously carried that condition to bring up her children in darkness. 
and I say in the book, my grandmother was not, my grandmother did not invent fortitude and courage. She was just cast in that role from which I learned that through perseverance you can overcome disability and lead your life and bring up your children even in total darkness. Those are some of the, the memories from which we learn a lot. And I let me touch a little bit on this thing of naming after I won't take a lot of time on it, but I talk about it strongly in the book that it has got a meaning. A prominent journalist, in fact, it was uh, Iman Rapeti when he interviewed me at some point about this book. She said to me, she was, she always knew that she was named after her grandmother. And then she says to me, it was not until she read this book that she fully appreciated the significance of being named after your relative. Because I said, no, being named after my grandmother made me feel that I was special. My grandmother, not that she didn't like other grandchildren, but she saw in me as some kind of her reincarnation into, into the world. And that closeness between me and her was so strong. In fact, I say in African culture, hey, ladies and gentlemen, when I am named after my grandmother, my mother would be careful how she speaks to me, how she handles me. She won't throw insults at me because you know why? They believe that I, I am her, her mother. When she calls me, she won't just say my son, she would sometimes she say Ma, mother, meaning I'm named after her, her mother. Mm. The respect that she will accord me, it is the kind of respect that she will respect to the person after whom I've been named. And Rapati said, when I read the way you explained the significance of naming after, I appreciate fully and love the idea of being named after my, my grandma. So, there's virtue, there's value, there's education in naming somebody after your mother or your father. It's up to you. You can name him after a Kuwaito champion. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that is your choice. But let me go to a set moment in answering your question that we learn their lessons locked up in happy and sad memories. You'll see in my book that I've disentitled myself of any cent, any proceeds from this book. I've donated every cent from this book to Diabetes South Africa. because I lost two of my three children at a young age, one at 40, one at 41. I lost, I lost both of them to diabetes. And at 40 and 41, each one of them left a young couple behind and as a young child behind. To me, those are some of the lowest, saddest memories in my life. But I learned from them. I learned the humanity of humans. I went through, and perhaps in passing, I mentioned very quickly that my three-year-old granddaughter was brutally murdered by people some years ago. That was also a low moment for me. But I learned the humanity of humans. People came, they would come in support of my family, they would pray with us, 
they will give us all moral support. In fact, after losing my grandson, my, 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 my son, who was the last, the presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Southern Africa, which encompasses Namibia, Lesotho, whatever, and the like, the presiding bishop, who happened to know about the, our losses, our, my, my series of losses, actually came to my house to come and pray. And I remember when he prayed, he said, God, we don't know much, you know better, but we as humans, we feel that this family has gone through a lot. It made me realize that even under difficult circumstances, there will be people who will care about you. Why can't we care about our own under difficult circumstances? As humans, I learned that. But in the book, Prof, in that connection, and I asked the question, have we lost our humanity? And I say in the book that I remember seeing on television a group of buffaloes coming to the aid of one buffalo which was attacked by lions. And they chased the lions away. And they rescued that buffalo. Compare to yourself. You go to the tavern, you kill 20 people, you shoot 10 people. Prof, are these animals better than us? Is it not time for us to sit back and think as ourselves, have we lost humanity? Are the animals actually better than us? They come to the rescue of one of them, but we come to kill one of us. And uh, you know why? Go and read the book. <laughs> <laughs> One, one, of, one of the things that I really loved about the book is that in each and every stage of your life, there was intense reflection. And um, I'm a pity myself, and there's something you wrote in there that made me chuckle. Chichiri uh, Rainaburoko, loosely translated, somebody chuckles, somebody knows what that means. It simply means the bed bug uh, will allow you no sleep. And you were speaking about a period when you went to boarding school. Uh, and the experiences and challenges that you had there that was posed uh, from Limpopo when you went to Pretoria. Can you chat a little bit about that and the lessons you learned? Uh, At that particular age, I think much, much of the audience were there. Yes, I, 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 I was trying to address myself in particular to the young people. That the, the difficult challenges under which some of us studied, we studied under the light of Kendall, I, I attended a, I went to a boarding school where I started with from two. The boarding school itself didn't have electricity. There was a generator, a diesel generator, which they would switch on for two hours so that we would study. Thereafter, we had to go to, to bed, all of us to sleep at the same time. They would flush the generator, flush the light twice, which means when they flush it for the third time, you must be in bed because the lights will all be gone. And uh, there was no warm water to talk about when we were at boarding school. There was no mattress to talk about. You know, we used to sleep on a, a bed with spring mattresses. Sometimes they would get too laxed, and then you would shift the, the hooks to try and tighten them. But on top of them, you would put cardboard boxes, yeah. and you sleep on there. That's, those are the conditions under which we studied. And I look at the conditions under which some of our children studied. They had attended boarding school, warm water, a diet approved by dietitian. <laughs> <laughs> they sleep on mattresses, warm water, and the like. Uh, and I asked them, I challenged them. There are better facilities and the like, and I challenged them. 
ought you not to do better than us? Mm. And added to that, we, we, we were the uh, perfect victims of the Bantu education system. You are better off. Somewhere in the book, I pay tribute to students of that time. The chapter is Triumph Over Bantu Education. And I say students of that time who studied under those difficult circumstances pa passed and passed and passed and passed. And I also throw a cover at the teachers. But first, I compliment the teachers who taught during that time under very difficult circumstances. Remember, black teachers that time, they were being discriminated against. They were in, and as much as white teachers. And even amongst black teachers, there were discrimination. Females were paid less. But I, pay, I paid special tribute to them. That subchapter says teachers who taught and taught and taught. Mm. That is the heading. And I tell how they never went on a strike. How they never left their students to go into a toy at the lawns of union buildings because they wanted more salary. And one time, one time, I was so angry. I was so angry with the teachers who were marking metric papers. They were in the middle of marking metric papers. They went on a strike. They said the government must pay them more. Otherwise, they are not going on proceeding to, to mark the metric papers. To me, that is not right. I'm not saying that people should not complain. I'm not saying people should not express their complaints, but find a better way a constructive way of expressing your dissatisfactions. Don't hold the education and future of our children at random. And I, I just felt I should pay special tribute to those teachers who taught me. And I say teachers who taught and taught and taught. And I say a lot of things about them. I close the chapter by saying <coughs> Those were the times when teachers taught nurses nursed, doctors doctors patients, minus mind, everybody worked. Mm. It's the only way we can build the economy of this country. We can give our children a better future. We can turn the fortunes or the misfortunes of this country around. One, one writer said that coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. On the 16th of June, 1976, we all know about the Soweto uprisings. But there was another incident of significance in your personal life. Can you tell us about that? Oh, after all the hustles, or being trained as lawyer and the like, and being trained and all going through all the exam, everything and the like. After serving article, being trained for three years, I was finally, I finally qualified to be admitted as an attorney. And lo and behold, the court admitted me as an attorney on the 16th of June, 1976. <laughs> and my friends, uh, used to tease me because I was the first African person to be trained by an African-speaking lawyer to become an attorney. And they used to say, oh, the, the admission of a first African person trained by African affirm to be admitted on the 16th triggered the revolution. In the <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful. 1976 was also significant uh, 
because it was the foundations of the Black Lawyers Association, which was formally founded in 1977. What has your association been with the BLA? And do you believe that they are still relevant in today's terms? Uh, we, we, we formed BLA Black Lawyers Association. I was one of the founding members because I was already an attorney at the time. Uh, we, we founded it because we were being treated differently to the way in which white attorneys were being treated. By the way, at that time, we were not allowed to, as black lawyers, to open offices in town. They said we must go and open offices in the, ta in the townships where there was no economy. And we didn't want to do that. And we, we formed the BLA in order to fight that. And I think we successfully we success, successfully fought that because in the end, we, we found ourselves practicing in, uh, in the offices in town. And do you believe that, because that organization was formed for a specific purpose, yes. is it still yes. relevant? Are those struggles still happening? You, you, you know, it's very simple to determine whether or not an association is relevant. You just look as to whether or not it continues to attract people, mm. whether it continues to hold meetings. In other words, whether it still continues to exist. No organization can outlive its need to exist. Mm. The very reason that Black Lawyers Association as a body still exists, it means there's a reason for it to exist. The minute there is no need for the Black Lawyers Association to exist, people will no longer attend the meetings. It will fizzle out. So what I'm trying to tell you is that black lawyers still have problems which we had, at least some of the problems that we had many years ago. There's still some discrimination in one form or another and perhaps discrimination is still there uh, in, a, in, a, in a bigger, broader, broader picture. In the book, you mentioned that um, defending a black trialist uh, was you know, given business for an advocate of color. And one of the persons that you, you defended was a man by the name of Gabriel Mahogwe. Very interesting story. Can you go into the details of that story? Um, I don't know whether I will attempt to go into the details there of Gabriel Mahakwe. Um, that was when I was still an advocate. And uh, he was, he had killed, and that's the sad history of our country. Now, I, I must tell you that the reason why I mentioned that case is because I take issue with people who say that the negotiations were a sellout. There should not have been any settlement. A settlement obviously means compromise. Now I ask the question, suppose there had not been any settlement, where would this country have gone? It was at a precipitous, the country would have gone to flames we would have continued killing each other as South Africans, white and black, and black and white, and so forth. And uh, the country would have been destroyed. We as South Africans, by we I mean black and white, would have destroyed each other. The country was heading that way. This, I validate this point by discussing this case of Mahakwe. Mahakwe had killed about four or five white people on a farm. And he was arrested. And he said that he wanted to be defended. First he said he wanted to be tried by a black judge. But during that time, there was no black judge in the country. And then he said he wanted to be defended by a white advocate. During that time, there was no, sorry, what did I say? White advocate. No. Black advocate. He wanted to be defended by <laughs> a, black. a black advocate. 
And during that time, there was no black advocate in, in um, the free state. There were only two advocates in the Transvaal at the time. It was myself and the former Deputy Chief Justice, Tihang Mosenek. It was just the two of us. We started more or less, we, both of us started as an attorney, and then we decided to become advocates. And we, both of us went to become advocates in, in Pretoria. So it, so it was just the two of us. So I was asked to go as a black advocate to go and defend Mr. Mahako in the free state. And I did so. And Mr. Mahakwe had absolutely no respect for the court. He, he held the police in utter contempt. He had no regrets that he had killed four or five white people. You know what he said in court? He said, by killing these four white people, I wanted to cut off the hand of apartheid, but unfortunately I only managed to cut the fingers of apartheid. Is that a nice thing to do, to say? No. It shows how deeply divided our nation was at the time. And Mr. Mahakwe said at some point He refused to, he came out of the vehicle. The policemen were all white, obviously, during that time. They parked the vehicle in front of the court one morning so that he could come in. He got out of the police vehicle. He sat on the tarmac in front of the court. He refused to stand up to go into court. They asked him. He refused. They turned to me as his advocate to convince him to get there. I turned away. I looked away. It was not my problem. You know what they did? They then picked him up by force, carried him on, strong white policemen put him on their, shoulder, on their shoulders and carried him in court. And once they dropped him in court, he laughed at them for that free lift. <laughs> <laughs> He held them in utter contempt. Yeah. And he held the entire system in utter contempt. And at some, at some point, the judge would speak hard to, to me at one time. He said, don't talk to my advocate like that. <laughs> and the judge would say, Mr. Mao, you are facing serious charges for which you could be sentenced to death. And he said, do you think I care about that? When you look at me, does it look like I care about being sentenced? I know you have already made up your mind to sentence me to death. And he said, if you sentence me to death, you'll kill only one person. I've killed four. <laughs> <laughs> and he went on to say, if you can should you not sentence me to death and let me out? I'm going to kill more. <laughs> what does that tell you about the division? Yeah. The deep hatred that was there in that, that country. Do you think the people who came to reach settlement were stupid? Do you think they did not foresee that our country was heading to disaster? Is there still any doubt? And by the way, he was sentenced he was to be sentenced to death, right? But in the, during that time, when, before they sentence you to death, to death, they gave you the opportunity to say something. And they asked him whether he, he had anything to say before I was sentenced to death. And he came to me and he said, can I say anything? I said, yes. He says, can I say whatever I want to say? I said, yes, it's your case. Did I have any, there any right to censor him? No. It was not my case. 
I said, of course you've got the right to see. He said so many things, some of them can be printed about Adam Cook and the women and the white people and that sort of thing. But he also said, um, white people, he was addressing himself to the judge and the assessor, they were all white. He said, you must get onto the path to go back to where you came from before there are thorns on that path. He was very clear. He had no regrets for having killed white people. He made very clear that if he were to come out, he would kill more. He was very clear about that. Now, that case, I mention it to demonstrate the point that the country was deeply divided. We don't want to go back there. We don't want to go back to a situation where a black, a black person would kill a white person simply because a white person is white and a black white person would kill a black person simply because a black person is black. All of which, ladies and gentlemen, used to happen. All of which, had we not somehow as South Africans, found a way of coming together to try and work out the future of this country, we could have gone there. When we think of the miraculous transition into a new democratic nation, we can't talk about it without mentioning the TRC, which you played a pivotal role in. Tell us about the rich pickings that you garnered from those experiences in the TRC. I was one of the three judges who were appointed then by the then president in 1996, President Mandela, to hear applications for amnesty. In other words, people, especially members of the security branch, would bring applications for amnesty. And also members of the uh, ANC, APLA, Omkondo Assisi and the like, who had committed certain crimes for political reasons, also had the right to bring applications for amnesty. In other words, to be forgiven for what they had done. But the, 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 the requirement was that you had to tell the truth, and all the truth and give all the details. Now, I therefore had to sit with those three other judges and listen to people giving gory details of how they poisoned people, gave people poison in order that people could literally waste away. Listen to details of how people at one time, they killed, member security branch killed people, threw them into crocodile infested rivers. At one time, killed somebody, some people, made a big fire, put them on the fire, and as those people were, were burning in order to destroy all the, the evidence, they were sitting there and enjoying some beers under the shade of a tree. Many gory details were told. We listened to that. One of, the, one, one of the stories I listened to was the story of two young boys from Mamelodi were taken to those peop people who know the N1. You go through the N1 towards the north, the place called Pinans River. They were taken there to be tortured and killed. One of the boys said, well, before you kill me, let me sing the national anthem. Which was at the time not welcome at the time. They allowed him to do that after which they killed him. And many other stories I listened to them. Now, listen, gentlemen, do you see how much price people paid for this freedom? I learned from 
the rich pickings I learned from that time when I sat and listened to all these things was that it was not only Solomon Mashango who paid with his life. Many, many other people paid for this freedom. Do we have got the right to trivialize the sacrifices these people made. People have died for this country to be where it is today. But once we took over the country, did we perpetuate their legacy? Did we properly honor their legacy and the sacrifices they made? Or did we just begin to steal, become corrupt, practice nepotism, not only stole, help the money to be stolen all over the country, but in fact, ladies and gentlemen, to facilitate that billions and billions of monies not only be stolen, but be cut out of the country so that it, they, not a cent can even be invested in this country to create employment. I have learned that we, we have trivialized the sacrifices people made. Not only people in, not only South Africans. Do you know that people in neighboring countries had their countries sometimes invaded by the South African uh, defense force because they gave shelter to our people? They invaded Botswana. They killed people in Botswana, people in Lesotho, in Zambia, and the like. Those people sacrificed for our freedom. Are we not trivializing their sacrifices by just giving our country to the dogs? And, and I'm saying that if you can can go back and read this book and read about the courage of the people that some of us defended who were never prepared even as they faced the court and possible death sentence they were never prepared to abandon their principles they never said no I'm not a freedom fighter they insisted that what they were doing was right at the risk of being sent to prison, which was which happened. Now I I I just think that uh, yes, all these things made me realize that uh, we have not learned anything, any lessons from the suffering and sacrifices these people made. The issue of the death sentence is one that is very contentious, and in the book. You choose to take no sides. When I was reading that, you mentioned that there was a particular judge who said, when you pass the death sentence, it impacts the condemned. There's a traumatic Im impact on the condemned. Yeah. It traumatizes the family. But what I found so interesting, he said, it traumatizes you as the judge. And I started wondering, because it's a, it's, we never think of what the judge goes through in passing a sentence, whether it's a death sentence, whether it's some imprisoning somebody for life. Can you give us a perspective from a judge's perspective to say when that sentence is passed, what is the impact on the judge? Uh, I don't know how, how many of you have seen um, how judges rope when they sit in a criminal court. You see, they put on a white robing. Do I have a picture of it here? No. They have got a red robing, and then they have got a black belt, which they tighten around here. It's this wide. They tighten it around here. And one day, somebody asked the late Judge Kumalo, who was a judge in Buputaswana, 
there was death sentence during the time when he, he was a judge. And somebody asked him, Judge, how do you feel when you pass the death sentence? He was playing a piano. He, and then he st suddenly stood up and said, now you are talking about something very serious. He said, you see, before you pass the death sentence, you must tighten that belt very tight. Otherwise, your tummy will run loose. <laughs> <laughs> so, the point I make then out of that, I mentioned that in the book, and I say, he demonstrated that the death sentence traumatized only the accused person the condemned person, it also traumatized the judge. When I first became a judge, by the way, the death sentence was still there. And I said in a case, I refer to it, in which a death sentence could properly have been imposed. Because that was a horrible case, details of which I have spared the reader. I, I spared the, a young reader or a children on a separate page. And and I said that suddenly I realized that I had the power to sentence somebody to death, to terminate the, the life of a human being. It didn't sit well with me because I reflected on whether or not it is appropriate to invest into an individual, the authority and power to terminate the life of another human being. Not that it shouldn't be done, but I'm just saying, I invite in the book, I say, I invite anybody who happens to be invested with certain powers to take decisions which can affect other human beings profoundly to exercise that power with insight and very, very, very carefully. And then I then plead to say, please, let us make sure when we appoint people in important positions, people whose decisions can impact negatively on other human beings, especially lesser human beings, let us make sure that we appoint people who will have proper insight into the power that we are giving them. Yeah. And that's the point I'm making in that book. I must say that when you look at some of the things since 1994, it is clear that we lost the ball. It is clear that we missed that point. We put people in certain critical and important positions. People whose decisions had the potential to impact on us strongly. But we put people into positions who lacked insight in those positions. And that's one of the problems. And that's why we, one day we are going to be like this like this man. All of us, if we don't learn from the past. But read the book. <laughs> <laughs> read the book. Judge uh, Mwepe, the road to being appointed judge president was a rather thorny one. There's a, a, a very humorous story you tell yeah, about the interview process. Humorous, but deep in meaning and, and, and lesson. Can you take us through that? Um, I tell that story because I want to warn all of you that in the event you aspire to be appointed to a strategic, a very strategic position 
in the country, whether in the public sector or in the private sector, you must expect that there will be a fight and you must fight for that position. My case is given, he is giving it as an example. I was to be appointed the judge president. And there were four, we were four candidates, by the way. All of the three were white gentlemen. Two of them were deputy judges president already at the time. One in Johannesburg, one in Pretoria. One was already a judge president of another court. I made up the rear. There comes me. I've been a judge for only five years, and these people have been judges for years. And phew, that was a very strategic position, which I initially didn't want, but I was persuaded to go in there. And I decided that I'll go in. Actually, my nomination went on the last day because I was not keen. I was persuaded by two people. One of them was uh, my colleague, then the advocate, Mr. Neke. You know, I was already a judge. He was in the private sector and, and advocate Mujangu Kumbi. They came to persuade me and bought me a very good lunch to persuade me to make myself. <laughs> My nomination went on the very last day, on the closing date, because I was not keen. But I went in anyway, and I was there, and I said, well, I have my own vision. I was interviewed. There were people who were dead against me. They wanted... One, I had one of the deputy judges president to be the judge president. And some wanted that other judge, someone who was already judge president. So I had a rough time. And I was asked so many questions and the like, but to come to the point, one of the people uh, who was dead against me, and by the way, the, my predecessor, who was the outgoing judge president, didn't want me. He wanted one of the deputies. So he was, was one of the people who asked hostile questions to me. And one of the people who was dead against me said to me, well, you must, you haven't been judge president. You must wait. Your time will come. Why, why can't you wait? Why can't you wait and let this, he meant that I must allow this, uh, the deputy judge president of his choice so that I'll come in. Why can't you wait? I said, no, I think it's my time. And he said, yeah, but why can't you wait? And then I got irritated. I said, I'm not prepared to wait. And he said, why? I said, I've been waiting for 350 years. Yeah. To be judge president. <laughs> And I'm no longer prepared to wait. Yes, sir. <laughs> there was a very awkward silence because somebody was trying to work out that 150 years back. <laughs> you take them to the time of Jan van Riebeck's <laughs> arrival. This guy says he's been waiting. <laughs> so there was an awkward silence. Everybody looked down. And then he broke the silence. And he said, but you don't, you haven't been the deputy judge president. How will you know how to run the court? Because you have never worked with Judge Ilov, who was the judge president. So you won't even know how Judge Ilov ran that court. Ran that court. I said, no, you are making a mistake. I never said I want to run that court the way Ilov wanted to run it. I want to run it, I'm going to run it my own way. I've never yeah. said that. <laughs> But, like I say in the book, there really was blood on the floor. There was, believe you me. And, but eventually I was appointed. But I'm just saying, and I, like I said, I mentioned that story for people to know that how critical the position of judge president was. Because if you are the judge president, you. I went there, I knew how critical the position was. Everybody knew. And I knew that once I get there, I was the only black judge, by the way. All of them were white in Pretoria. And I knew that once I go there, 
I'm going to make sure that I train and get a lot of black people to be appointed judges. Mm. Earlier on, Prof, I told you why I left after being judge president for 14 years. Two reasons. One the reason was that I realized in the history of that court, I had served as the judge president the longest, 14 years. And I said, oh, well, I must go. Very soon I'll be saying, my court, my court. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think I own this institution. Yeah. But there was another reason. I told you I was the only black judge there, in, and there was no woman judge, white or black. And in Jobek, I think there was one black judge, but in Pretoria, I was the only black judge. I made it a point that I, I was going to change the face of that court to make sure to recruit as many black judges as possible. I embarked on some projects to train black lawyers, even raised money from abroad to train black lawyers to prepare them to be, make them ready to be appointed judges. I reached a point, having been the only black judge in that country, like in, in Pretoria, and one, that one in Jobe, I reached a point where more than 50% of the judges in Pretoria and Johannesburg were black. Mm. And there were women. And I said, I said, what is there for me to achieve? I came here to change the face of this court. Now more than 50% of the judges are black and I've served the longest period as judge president in the history of this court. What is there for me now to do? I must go. Why? Because I felt that there was life beyond being a judge. They said to me, but you have not yet reached the, retirement, the, the retiring age. And I said, well, that's not the point. I came here with an objective. I've achieved that objective. I'm going. I took optional retirement. <laughs> I, I once attended a funeral where one of the speakers comforted the woman who had lost her husband. And uh, the speaker said to the, to the, to the, to the widow, your, your wife, your husband is not the youngest, somewhere in the middle. His elder brother and the one come there are still alive, but God decided to jump them and take your husband, and your husband agreed to go. He said, yeah, you know, it was, it was a good thing that your husband agreed to go when God called you. The most impossible people to live with are the people who refuse to go when it's their time to go. Yeah. <laughs> you can look in politics. There are people who are asked yeah. to go, they refuse to go. <laughs> <laughs> and they became impossible to live. It reminds me of something one politician said. They said, no matter how good of a dancer you are, at some point you must leave the the, the, the second. Exactly. <laughs> Leave it to others. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you were the first uh, judge president of color, the first lawyer of color in a white law firm, the first tax ombudsman, the first black chancellor of UNISA, and the list goes on. Do you view it as a blessing or a burden to be a, a pathfinder, a trailblazer? Because there is such an enormous amount of responsibility to represent your people in that particular position? It is actually both. It is a blessing and it is also a burden. It is a blessing in the sense that you are given the privilege to play a role in your life and do as much as you can in some people's life, there's a lot of emptiness between two days, the date of their birth and the date of, of their death. <laughs> you, you, you find a lot of emptiness. Yeah. Now, 
it was a blessing I was given that privilege. And you know, when we speak about this emptiness, I, oh, I just remember uh, one vice chancellor of one university telling me about a funeral he had attended. A young man, not a young man, a man in his 40s, 50s had died. And you know, African culture, we speak, somebody must speak on behalf of the family. And they appointed somebody to speak on the occasion of his funeral. And uh, that person was supposed to say some good things about him. And uh, throughout the week, they came together to try and remind each other of the good things he did. They tried to think, they scratched their heads. <laughs> <laughs> Friday evening, the person who was supposed to speak announced that there's a breakthrough. He has now discovered what he should say. This disease had done. And everybody was curious, but he kept it to himself because he wanted to surprise everybody. So the following day on a Saturday, he stood up to speak. And he stand up, stood up to speak and he said this man once did a wonderful thing in his life he brought his, his mother the antenna of a television set <laughs> <laughs> and then sat down <laughs> empty <Emptiness>. there <laughs> That, that, that was the only thing that person did. And that, even that came after a lot of head scratching. The, the breakthrough was made only on Friday. Wow. So, it is a privilege to be allowed to express yourself. It's a blessing to be allowed to express yourself. And I say to you in the book, I say, where is that... Uh, Maybe I can have that quotation which Judah, Judah put together a few uh, uh, quotations out of the book. Uh, while, while the judge is looking for it, please prepare, prepare a few questions. We are going to have our Interest, um, interaction session quite now. Uh, so for those online as well and in the house, prepare your questions. Uh, as the judge mentioned, Ada, he loves to interact with young people. So prepare your questions. <coughs> I, I say to you with reference to what I've just said in the book. Prof, I'm conscious I'm speaking of the fact that I'm talking to young people. That's what he told me. Yeah. You stand by that. <laughs> right. In the book, I say somewhere, I didn't know the page, but I say young people should be allowed to be young, provided, of course, their conduct remains within the parameters of the law and good behavior, free of responsibilities that restrain their parents. They have the freedom to venture into the unfamiliar with potential reward. What I'm saying is, go and fill that space. We don't want to, when you are gone to be scratching our heads as to what to say. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a blessing because I was given that privilege to express myself. But mm. it was also a bet. Yes. If, if you are first, 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 it is your responsibility to make sure, particularly in the context of this country. If you are the first black judge president, you must make sure that you don't fail. Yeah. And to make sure that you don't fail, you must go there and be yourself. Don't try to be Judge Elof, Judge President Elof, mm. who was my predecessor. 
Don't go there and say, I'm going, I want to go and be that other person, the person you are not. You will never be that person. But you have got the responsibility to succeed. And this is important. If you are a pathfinder, particularly in the context of this country, and you're black, you have the responsibility to prove those people are skeptical about black people, to prove them wrong. You have that responsibility. If you fail as a first black person, there are people who are going to say, aha, we told you. We told you black people won't do it. Therefore, you carry that burden as the pathfinder. One, to make sure that you succeed. Secondly, and very importantly, you must be a true pathfinder. You must open the way for others to come, to follow you. So that when your bones and sorrows are dust and your achievements are dust, mm -hmm. those people will continue with that legacy that you shall have left you have that special responsibility. You know, I, I once addressed a group of black people, attorneys in the free state, and I castigated them. I'd say, you don't prepare, you don't come to work, you must prepare. You say you want work, but you must end work on merit. Don't just say, people must give me work because I'm black, and then you don't do your work properly. You must prepare. And somebody said, mm, well, you're not hard on black practitioners. I said, no, I might, be, I might have been hard on them because I've seen some of them appear before me totally ill-prepared. Let me tell you this story. And, and I told that person this story that, that as I told to other people. There was a judge who in Pretoria, his son was an advocate in Pretoria. And people say that each time his son appeared before him, he gave him a lot of rough time, demanded a lot of, the, of his son. In fact, one of his colleagues went to him and said, look, you are just being hard on your son unnecessarily. He's like, other, he's like other advocates. And the judge banged the table and said, that is my problem. That is my problem. I don't want my son to be like other advocates. I want them to, him to be better than other advocates. Mm. I want you to be better. <laughs> I don't want you to to be put in a situation where you will fail and disgrace us. So, yes, to be a first can be a blessing, which is fine, but it also is a burden. You have got certain responsibilities which you, you must live up to. Thank you, sir. Uh, I believe we've got a roving mic. Uh, if you've got a question, please raise your hand. Uh, gentlemen in the front, is there a mic available for you? And for those online, we'll also be accepting online questions. Oh, all right, we'll start there, then him. Just state your name and then your question, please. Uh, Dumelang Kaufela. Uh, my name is Ritu Meze Senawana. Thank you so much, Judge, for the wisdom. Can I lay two questions? One starts ka the inarticulate major premise. Uh, I was listening to the story you told regarding the death sentence and how you had to reconsider you know, the judgment. My question is, has there ever been a time where your sum experiences, some collection of all your experiences, 
made you decide any judgment just based on the fact that your collection of uh, experience um, this would be let's say for example like for instance you mentioned that your great your granddaughter was brutally murdered would you say that as a judge that would have influenced you if a murderer was before you or how put differently how did you you know not let that experience influence you in making judgments and then the second question is regarding patriotic patriotism judge i must be honest with you i feel like in south africa we are not a nation we are just people so my question is how do we become patriotic when there is no national plan or national uh, effort to unify us especially as young people so yes the first question is regarding the inarticulate major premise then the second one is patriotism thank you i think we'll we'll tackle each question as as it comes okay uh, i'm not so sure i must understand the inarticulate part of it but i think the 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 thrust of your first question was whether I, I would have been able to be objective or be uninfluenced in in dealing with with criminal cases or criminals given uh, the incident that you mentioned about my granddaughter um, I, I i i i think that maybe as a result of the kind of training that one gets as a lawyer as an attorney and later as an advocate <clears throat> you are quite capable of being objective what i couldn't do of course would have been i was the judge president at the time when my my granddaughter was was murdered and uh, I could not have had that case myself obviously but when it comes to any other case it's a different incident it's a different accused accused person I would have no problem whatsoever uh, in in being objective with regard to that obviously if it was a different case by then the accused happened to be someone who had murdered my granddaughter again obviously i wouldn't do that but you are you are capable of distancing yourself and be objective when you deal with a criminal case irrespective of your past and it should not be difficult to do that because for example if i hear a murder case i wouldn't be related to the deceased and i wouldn't be related to or no the accused so i'm quite capable of being objective uh, in, in 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 such a situation and perhaps just as a to as a matter of of interest when as i say i was the judge president when my granddaughter was murdered and you may ask yourself who had that case maybe i could just as well deal with that and say to you uh, the case was in Johannesburg and i said told i was the judge president of both courts pretoria and joburg and i told i had two deputies one in pretoria one in joburg and i told my deputy in johannesburg i said to him uh, rule number one no judge is going to from this court any judge working under me is not going to do this case it must be a judge from outside number 2 it's not for me to decide where this judge must come from which from which court the judge must come from you decide and when you decide to speak to the judge president of that court don't tell that judge president which judge must come here you decide which judge president 
to approach, to send a judge here to come and do that case. I didn't even tell him which court, which court judge president he must go to. And I said to him, you must not suggest the name of the judge to that judge president. That judge president must himself decide which judge to send here. You see the distance I was trying to create between myself. I didn't even know which judge was coming to do that case. I just saw that judge walk in to do that case. And I didn't even attend the case because I didn't want people to say Judge President Weber was sitting there. Maybe he was, you know, <laughs> to the judge, some such thing. So no, I didn't. I just, I only went on the last day when they were going to announce the sentence because the judge had reserved the sentence and said, I'm going to give my sentence on the 20, for example, on the 27th, 28th of July. And then I knew on the 20th of July, he had already prepared his sentence. If I, even if I can sit in, court, sit in court and he sees me in court, it won't change anything because he's already written his, his sentence. And yes, you maintain that distance. What was the next question? Patriotism. He says he feels that we are not a nation that feels like a nation. It feels like we're just those people put together. How do we build that spirit of patriotism? Well, that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> 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 now, I'll give you a little bit of information. I won't deny you all the answers. I'll give you. I've told you that, you know, we must value. Patriotism is informed by our appreciation of the value of the freedom that we have. In other words, the desire, the motivation, the commitment to protect that freedom and value it is a sense of patriotism. And if, 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 if you want to appreciate the true value of our freedom, and you go into that book, you'll find, for example, as I've already said, you'll find stories where I tell you of how people told me actually tortured by the police in order for us to be free. How people went to prison and the sacrifice that not only people who went to exile may, made, but many, many people. And please let me emphasize this point while I'm at it. Many people fought apartheid, sacrificed for our freedom. Many people, both white and black, men and women. And I give you examples in the book of people who, white people who sacrificed for our freedom. And I mentioned, for example, people like Dr. Bears Nodie on whom I had the privilege, the honor of conferring an honorary doctorate when I was the chancellor of UNISA while he was still alive. Many, many white people, not only white people, ladies and gentlemen, even African speaking people like Bram Fisher of this world, those people made that. And, 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 and if, 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 if you look back into history, how people suffered for for this freedom. You will have no choice but to begin to value it. And that uh, motivates, is the motivation for that sense of patriotism. What has happened to the, you know, I don't want to be too angry, but we have failed to learn from the apartheid regime and its people. The apartheid regime looked after their own people. They made sure that every black, white child went to a decent school. They made a point that every white household, even an isolated farmer there, got electricity. They would take electricity to an isolated farm house there on the farm to deviate the line and go to supply one farmer there on the farm 
electricity, but you failed to apply to supply electricity to an entire village. Mm. What kind of patriotism is that? Well, I'll read the book. Read I've, the book. I've given you the <laughs> Sir, your name and the question, please. Thank you so much, Judge, um, for your wonderful and insightful dialogue and interaction. So for me, when I hear you are reciting your, the book and your stories, you are more of a leader. And my name is Ponzo Mantlacha. Sorry about that. Um, um, you are more of a leader, right? So what's your take on today's leadership in government? And my second question is the judiciary system. I think as a citizen, it favors the rich. For example, when a politician um, is found guilty in the court of law, they might sentence them to a fine. And when an ordinary citizen is found guilty in the court of law, they might pay the price of a life sentence or five years. Example, the Sibungile Mani story, the lady who the NSFS money just, you know, appeared in her bank account and yeah, she spent it. She she had fun, you know. So <laughs> so and she was sentenced to five years and um what have you let I mean for perjury, she was given a fine. So would you say um the system favors the rich? Thank you so much. Um you'll have to remind me the this first question, because my mind moves with him. What was the first question? So the first question was about leadership in today's government, because oh, you yes. were no, a leader I remember yourself. You. Yes. you said, what do I think about today's leadership in the government? Um, I, think, I think there are many areas in which uh, the government made mistakes. And we pay for those mistakes. I didn't, like I said, I don't even remember whether I mentioned the ANC uh, in my book in that context. But what I can say is that fundamental mistakes were made. One of them was that we appointed to very strategic and important positions people not on merit. And that's why some institutions collapsed. That was the mistake, some of the mistakes that were made. For example, I was told some years ago that uh, as a result of the influence of unions such as Nahau, Chief Executive Officer of a hospital could be somebody who was a geography teacher at the primary school. Now I would say this person must be appointed because he's a good administrator. All we want is a good administrator at the hospital. No, no, no. It's not all that you want at a hospital, a good administrator. You want somebody who would know a lot about health. Somebody who will be able to exercise a discretion as to which equipment is more vital to be bought by the hospital with limited resources? A geography teacher can do that kind of exercise of discretion and judgment. It is only somebody who actually knows how a hospital works and how the, the mechanisms and instruments and all those things work at the hospital. But in Limpopo, we're told that until Mutsualedi came, MEC and questioned, why would a history teacher be appointed at a CEO of a hospital and the like, and reversed some of those things. We were appointing people to vital positions, not on merit, but <coughs> on the basis of political connectivity, nepotism, and anything but merit. That's what, that, I think that's where we went wrong. There, there, there may be other, other things that 
other, other things that, that uh, were wrong, but I'm just mentioning one of the most important things, vital things that, mistakes that we made. Now coming to your next question, I'm, I'm mentioning a few others, by the way, in the book. And I have, I have said uh, that once we were in power, we failed to learn from the commitment which the apartheid practitioners displayed. You know why this why apartheid lasted for so many years? Do you know that under apartheid, millions and millions, many millions of black people were oppressed by a, a few three million white people? You know why? Because those apartheid practitioners and apologists and enforcers were determined, they were committed to make sure that apartheid succeeded. They were committed to make sure that every white person gets A, B, C, D, but not a black person. Did we learn from that commitment? Once we took power in 1994, did we learn? Did we replicate? Did we learn from that commitment and show that commitment? Did we learn? Did we, we with the same commitment, fight unemployment? With the same commitment, make sure that people get water, running water, electricity. Did you show that kind of commitment? We failed, man. We failed to learn lessons from the, from the apartheid apologists. Had we done that, every black child today would, have, would, have, would, have, would be having good education. People everywhere will be having running water. People everywhere would be having shelter above their head. There would be employment. We failed to learn that. Why did we fail to learn that? You know, somebody complimented me about Spady Sarek. Why did you fail to do this for your people? <laughs> 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 but when I didn't do things right and right, my mother would say, Wow, Louis, wow, Louis, Mutual Louis, Mutual Louis, Mukile Halen, Kalata, Kalamu. Bali Louis, the man. Wow. On your, on your. What, what, one, yes. what was his next question? Second question is if I may paraphrase, let me paraphrase, please. Oh. Succinctly. Yeah, mention it. Well, you said that it favors the rich, right? Um, not quite, not directly. The only thing is that the way it operates, sometimes people can, with money, they can get the services of the most experienced lawyers. Now, if you are a judge and somebody has the money to employ the services of a highly experienced lawyer, you can't stop him. No, they've got the right to do that in terms of the Constitution. So it's not that the judiciary as such favors the rich. It's just that the way things unfold sometimes, money does um, help you to get certain services which a poor person may not be able to get. But I also have a quarrel with the, with the judiciary to some extent. I've always complained that, and you refer to that in passing, when it comes to white collar crime, our judiciary is too lenient. Somebody steals 10 million rand. You read about somebody t stealing 10 million rand and then they'll give them five years or eight years. Or even say, pay back the money, and then the, sen the sentence becomes quite lenient and the like. The problem I have with the judiciary in this country is that sometimes we become too lenient with white collar crime. And white collar crime destroys the economy of the country. 
I addressed students of the University of Cape Town one time, commerce, commerce, commerce students, they asked me to come in, address them on some of these issues. And I said to them, imagine a couple, an elderly couple in the rural areas whose total wealth comprises of two round doubles, two and a half cattle, five chicken. The old man every morning goes out with, all the time he's in an overcoat, whether it's hot or cold, it's the only jacket he has. But he, he's tendering his kettle, he looks after his kettle, and the old lady looks after her four or five chicken. That's their total wealth. Now imagine stealing from such a person. Do you know that when you steal government money, taxpayers' money, do you know that you are stealing from such a couple mm. at the end of the day? Because the money that supposed the government which is supposed to use prudently is the money that is supposed to benefit those people. But you steal it, in fact steal it as I've said, <laughs> steal it in billions and get it out of the country. White collar crime in my view, is sometimes not adequately punished. I will agree with you on that one. But having said that, be careful to compare cases that easily. They say in no case are ex cases are exactly the same. Um, you, you know, you can't say because this one stole this Nefsa's money, therefore must get this, blah, blah. This one got seven years, so therefore, no. Otherwise, we'll have to leave cases to the computers to decide and just fit in the data. Then the computers will produce uniform, similar sentences. It doesn't work like that. Every single case is different in facts and time from another case. So guard against this tendency. People often say, that, one, that person committed murder, was given 15 years. That one committed murder, but was given life. But they both committed murder. Why the difference? No, that is too superficial and dangerous a comparison. Thank you, Judge. Uh, we've got a few questions from our online audience. Uh, what are the limitations of judges to comment or make recommendations on political matters? And is the judiciary transformed enough to change the status quo of how laws are applied for those who are poor and for those who are rich financial. I think the second question has been tackled, so we'll tackle the first one, which says, what are the limitations of judges to comment or make recommendations on political matters? Um, I, I think if they, if they said uh, recently, it is inappropriate for judges to, to comment, comment on political matters, depending on the context. But you see, the thing is, as a judge, you are supposed to be to take no sides um, in any dispute. Now, if you make certain comments, they may give an impression that uh, political comments. If you make certain political comments, they may give an impression that you. You, you sympathize with a particular political party. <clears throat> but it depends on how you really make those comments. Because sometimes, what is politics, what is not politics? <clears throat> I mean, is it not politics when I say, when you steal from an elderly couple, you destroy the economy? It could be defined as being politics. But it depends on the context, on how you really say it. And the, 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 the thing is, I retired many years ago, but you still call me a judge, and correctly so, because as they say, once a judge, always a judge. And if you are a judge, you are not allowed to join a political party, by the way, let alone attending the rallies. Um, because you are supposed to be neutral. The, the idea is for judges to be neutral and not take sides because 
They are the people who sit and adjudicate disputes between whether it's ANC and the DA or whatever and the like. So you, you must be in the middle. And the, the restriction is just to make sure that a judge's impartiality is not compromised. Thank you, Judge. We've got a question from Tombi Chicago. Uh, she says, I'm very much interested in cyber law, but in South Africa, it seems everything is still manual, few things which are computerized in South African courts and poorly developed. How can you develop cyber law since society now depends on digital technology? I think there's a movement towards that, that direction. I know that uh, the judiciary is trying its best to try and, as they say sometimes, to be paperless, to be paperless. Um, but again, that has to be done very carefully because you don't want to leave behind uh, a large number of our people. What, 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 one of my objectives when I became judge president was to to, to say, during apartheid, black people did not feel that they be, the, the judiciary, they belonged to that judiciary, they, that judiciary belonged to them. It was, that judicial, judiciary was foreign to them. It was not part of them. And one of the things that I did, and of course that negatively affected the credibility of the judiciary. And one of the things that I did was to try and make people feel that this judiciary is theirs. It belongs to them. And a large number of our people, especially in rural areas, uh, are still not having access to, access to internet and the like. So we must balance things. If we, must, if we move too fast, and digitize too quickly and too fast, we may, we may leave behind a large number of our people. And then again, they will feel that the judiciary, this judiciary is not theirs. It doesn't belong to them. So a proper balance is needed. Thank you, Judge. Uh, a question from Lee Tlonfilo. A wonderful judge. Uh, in your career in the bench, have you passed judgments that you felt were in line with the law? but left your conscience uneasy afterwards. But, oh. uh, so have you passed judgments that you felt were in line with the law, but left your conscience uh, uneasy afterwards? You mean that kind of contradiction? Yeah, where, no, was, was where, where you feel you had to apply the law which you don't like applying, but you... Yeah. No, no, really, uh, I, 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 I didn't. I, I don't recall having to say uh, I don't like this, but my hands are tied. I've got to do this. Um, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't recall doing that. There's just one case where um, it left me unhappy. It came from the judgment from one, one judge. And then the people appealed. You know, th this, these were people who were living on a, f on a farm somewhere in Pumalanga, and they had buried their loved ones on that farm. And suddenly, the, I think it was the son or the head of the family died. And the, the, the owner of that farm was a white person. He refused permission, them permission to bury, to bury their, their father on that farm and said, no, I don't want you to bury this person on my farm. Go and bury us. He went to the court. The judge dismissed their case. They then appealed. I sat with two judges who were three. And the two judges said, the two judges agreed with the judge who dismissed and dismissed they appeal and say the farmer was right. I disagreed with that judge, with those two judges. I wrote my own separate dissenting judgment 
And I said, well, his ownership, his right of ownership to the property, a 300 hectare farm, can hardly be said to be encroached by putting a grave which is 1.5 meter wide and three meters long. And besides, these people say that they were doing this for certain uh, ancestral African religious reasons. They wanted to bury this man here. So I think uh, the farmer is wrong. But the two judges said that, well, in terms of the strict law, the farmer is right. And I lost, the, I lost because I was in a minority. I was not happy with that law. I then wrote to the government and said, much as I accept that the judges, the two judges, is the, because they're the majority, is the right judgment of the court, I think the law must be changed. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with this. And I wrote to the Department of Justice, I think. And then the law was then amended to say that, to bring it more in line with my view. Yeah. Wonderful. <clears throat> uh, Judge, you've served this nation with distinction. You've led with excellence. Uh, earlier on, you humorously mentioned uh, that some, some people, there's nothing there. There's just the, <laughs> the beginning and the end. Uh, it's the area, like, it's TV area. A TV area. <laughs> so it's birth, TV area, end. <laughs> I think with your story, there's more than just a TV area in the middle. <laughs> what would you like to be remembered for? What, what is the contribution that stems heavily in your heart that this is my contribution, this is what, when I, my time comes, I want to be remembered for? Uh, well, I, I really don't know. I always say that as a first statement to you, we must be careful to think that we have done enough. Nobody has done enough. For as long as there's huge unemployment, young people like this in their millions are unemployed, nobody has done enough. For as long as peop there are people without shelter over their heads, we have not done enough. For as long as the people without running water, without electricity in this country, we have not done enough. I must be careful not to sound as if I've done enough. Mm -hmm. I've always said, I don't want to audit myself. I want other people to audit me, to audit my life, and then decide for themselves whether the contributions that I have made were significant, and if so, to what extent. But I would be happy if people can remember me for having, from time to time, raised the concerns that I had, in particular, the concerns that I have right now about the situation in this country. Because I know for a fact that when we were sitting around, the parties were sitting around in 1993 to thresh out that constitution, I know for a fact this is not the kind of South Africa that we had in mind. I know for a fact we have lost the ball. I know for a fact we have dropped the ball. I know for a fact that we have gone wrong. And I'll be happy if people can just remember that among the many, many responsible South, South Africans of huge importance, there was this fellow called Bernard Mwepe who also expressed his concern that we have dropped the ball. I just want people to remember that I once <coughs> raised my voice not only did I just raise my voice, but I wrote something so that, as I've said, so that when my bones 
and sorrows are dust. Someone will read and say, this, this, this is what this person said. As to the quality of and the significance of what I did and said, I leave for others to audit me. I'm open to auditing. Uh, they, they, they say that who, those who do not learn from their past are doomed to repeat it. Uh, Judge, thank you so much for digging into your, your well of wisdom and drawing out so much for us to drink upon and quench our thirst. Can we please stand up and give him a round of applause? Thank you. I must acknowledge.